how's it going? Glad to be here tonight. Hope you guys are excited to be here tonight. It looks like some of y'all are. I think some of y'all not sure, but Graham's sure. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Well, hey, we're excited that you all are here and uh, excited that we're kicking off another great year. We kicked it off last week, keeping it going here this week. A couple things as we get started. First of all, just as a reminder and an encouragement, when we come in here, this is our time to worship together. And I love looking around during that last song and seeing so many of you getting that and lifting up your hands and lifting up your voices and singing these songs and not using this as a time to talk with your friends or check uh, your phone or do things like that. I'm glad to see that. And I, I want to keep going after that. My hope and prayer is that when we come in here, we worship with all of our hearts and all of our minds and with all of our strength so that when New people come in, they see what's happening here, and they say, wow, this is awesome. I've got to be a part of this. So y'all are getting there, and I'm excited about how we're going to continue to grow as worshipers here in the coming weeks. Now, during this time, when we focus in on worship, when we dive in on the Word, if you're here, you say, you know what, Brian, I've really got to use the bathroom during this time. Well, during this time, we say the bathrooms are closed, now, we're not going to make you explode in your seat because we don't want that to happen. So you can get up, and if you do need to use the bathroom, go and grab one of the adults sitting around you, and uh, they will be happy to take you to the restroom and bring you back. But if you do need to use the bathroom during this time, please grab an adult. Also during this time, let's go ahead, take our phones, put them away. You say, well, Brian, my Bible is on my phone. Well, the good news is we have put a ginormous Bible on the screen for you. Because I know that even when I sit in worship, my phone is a major distraction to me. And so I need to make a habit of putting it away. I didn't bring mine up here because you guys probably don't want to watch me check my Twitter updates while I'm preaching. So just a couple of things to help us worship God as He deserves to be worshipped here tonight. I've got one other big thing to share with you because it's going to really fit with our series. I hope you guys have been watching the stats that have been coming on the screen on the video before the sermon and they remind us of just how many people out there in Cherokee and Cobb counties need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, I am, I am super excited to have over 200 middle schoolers in this room tonight. Uh, to have about 300 high schoolers next door in the warehouse. But you know what? 500 is great, but it's not much compared to the numbers we saw on the screen. There's a lot of lostness. There's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people not in church tonight not in church on Sunday morning. And so my challenge to us over the course of this series is, who do you know that needs to be here? We all know somebody that needs to be here. And uh, I hope that you will invite them, get them to come out, because guess what? In two weeks, we are going to have a super opportunity for you to bring a friend to Pulse. We're going to have a game day tailgate. Oh, yeah. It is going to go from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock outside. So whenever you get done with practice, get over here or whatever you can get here. It's going to go all the way up to 7 o'clock. We're going to have big old inflatables that you guys can play on. We're going to have the basketball inflatables. We're going to have the bungee run. We're going to have the ball you get in and run around in. It's going to be really, really cool. We're going to have a jumbo obstacle course. We're going to have prizes for people. And uh, come dressed in your favorite team's gear. Okay, so if that's the Atlanta Falcons, if that's the Georgia Bulldogs, if that's the Woodstock Wolverines, whatever your team is, come dressed as that, and we're going to have prizes that night. And I, I forgot the best part. And, and this one really speaks to my heart because this is close to my heart. We are going to have free food for everyone who comes. Free burgers, hot dogs, pizza, and drinks. So... My prayer and my hope is that this room coming up in two weeks is packed out with middle schoolers that were packed out next door. I'm praying for 700 to show up, and we're going to have an amazing, amazing night. And here's the best part of all. We're going to come in here at 7 o'clock. We're going to sing, and then we're going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Sound like something you guys can get into? All right. Start thinking now. Who can I get to come out to the warehouse Two weeks, the very first Wednesday in September. Now, let me go ahead and pray for us. And if you have a Bible with you in, in this form, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8. Last week we were in Acts chapter 4. Now we're in Acts chapter 8. As we continue the series, this is your mission. And I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. And then we're going to dive in 
and uh, look at what is really an amazing eight verses here in Acts chapter 8. Let's pray. Father, I am so excited for every student in this room tonight to be here. Uh, Because, Lord, they're here, a lot of them, because they know you and they love you. And that is incredible. There's also, I know, some in this room, God, who who don't yet know you. I pray that tonight they would decide to receive you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray for all of us in this room, God, that you would challenge us, inspire us through your word to go out on mission and make an impact in our world. Maybe just with one person. And it's an awesome call. I pray, God, we would answer it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I love movies, y'all. Anybody else here love movies? Got some movie fans? What are, your, what, are, what are some of your favorite movies? Who wants to share? Favorite movie? Avengers Age of Ultron. All right. Somebody else like that. What are some other favorite movies? God's Not Dead. Oh, the Jesus juke on us right there. That's a good one. All right. Ant-Man. All right. Have not seen Ant-Man. Would like to see it. Star Wars. Good choice. Soul Surfer. All right. Make you afraid to swim in the ocean, but a good movie. The Hunger Games. All right. May the odds be ever in your favor. Jurassic World. Awesome. What? The what? The Lego movie. Oh, we love the Lego movie in our house. I've watched like a hundred times. Let's see. I'll get. Everything is awesome. <laughs> Everything is cool when you're part of it. Okay. Favorite movie, Paige? Batman. Batman. Just all Batmans. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get one more. I'm going to come right back here. All right, here we go. Last one. Nike shirt. Yes. Favorite movie? Pac-Man. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Good stuff. Well, here, here's the deal. I love movies, and you guys probably love movies too, because we love stories. And I want to share a couple of my favorite stories with you from movies. First of all, the story of Luke Skywalker. I'm talking the original three Star Wars. And when we find Luke Skywalker in the first Star Wars movie, we find him on the planet of Tatooine as a moisture farmer living out in the middle of nowhere, doing nothing with his life. Then all of a sudden, two droids show up on his moisture farm. He discovers a hidden message in one of the droids that leads him to Obi-Wan Kenobi. And next thing you know, this moisture farmer from Tatooine is battling the evil empire and caught up in a fight for the fate of the galaxy. Or another one of my favorite stories uh, is about Bilbo Baggins. Any fans of The Hobbit here? Of course, we know that Bilbo... When we first meet him in the Hobbit movie, is just a normal, ordinary Hobbit from the Shire, smoking his pipe, eating his cheese, and doing pretty much nothing with his life. But then, guess what? In comes Gandalf the wizard, who invites him on an adventure. And at first he refuses, but eventually he joins. He gets caught up in a battle to recover a lost kingdom, and really a battle for the future of Middle-earth. Well, then another one of my favorite stories... It's a Pixar story because I love Pixar. Anybody else Pixar fans? And it's about a fish named Marlin. And Marlin, Marlin, well, you know, he's just, he's happy to live in his sea anemone and never go anywhere else, just a normal clownfish, until one day his son is taken away. And Marlin ends up going on an adventure through all of the ocean, battling jellyfish and whales and sharks to find his son. But another one of my favorite stories, and uh, it's actually my wife likes it more than I do, but this is for the ladies here, is about a girl named Tris. And Tris is part of a faction in a future world called, I I have a hard time with this word, abnegation. Did I get it right? Abnegation. Right? And, And she is living a normal life in abnegation until she discovers that she is divergent, but instead of just going off and living with the factionless, she joins Dauntless and gets caught up in a battle to save her former faction and save 
the future of their world. And then another one for you ladies coming out here in November is, of course, Katniss Everdeen. Any Hunger Games fans? And we all know that Katniss was just living a normal, ordinary life in District 12. She was just hunting for food, providing for her family, making googly eyes at Gale. When one day, when one day, her sister Prim was chosen for the Hunger Games, and instead Katniss volunteered as tribute. And she ends up going off and fighting in the Hunger Games and ends up caught in a battle for the future of her world to take down the evil capital and President Snow. And then, of course, my, maybe my favorite one of all tells the story of a boy who was an orphan and who had no home when he was taken in one day by a kindly older man. And when that boy grew up, he went to work for his adopted father in a factory making toys. And then one day, his adopted father came to him and said that you have a true father. He lives in a place called New York City. And this orphan boy journeyed through the seven layers of the candy cane forest and the sea of swirly, twirly gumdrops and then through the Lincoln Tunnel to find his adopted father. And of course, I'm talking about Buddy the Elf. All right? And Buddy goes on a mission, and he meets a bunch of depressed, unhappy people and brightens their lives with the power of Christmas cheer. Changes his world. Now, here's the thing about these stories. All of them have a common theme. And I think we love these stories because that common theme is hardwired into us as human beings because it's a common theme we find in the Bible, and it's this theme— a person living an ordinary, boring life who is called out of that life into a mission to change the world and make a difference. It's the same thing that unifies all those stories. And in fact, it's the same story that we've been given in the Bible. God has the same plan for us to call us out of our ordinary, boring, mundane, mediocre lives and give us a mission that we cannot even begin to imagine. The question is, will we answer the call? Because can you imagine if those people that we just named had not answered the call? What if Luke Skywalker had just said, you know what, it sounds dangerous fighting the empire. I'm just going to stay here and be a moisture farmer. End of the movie. Or, or can you imagine if Bilbo Baggins had said, no, I'm just going to stay here with my books in my armchair sipping my tea. Or what if, ne what if Marlin had said, you know what, I never liked that kid anyway. The ocean is a big, scary place, and I'm not going out there. Or can you imagine, right, if Triss had just decided to go live with the factionless and be content with that? Or what if Katniss had been like, have a fun time in the games, Prim. See you later. <laughs> you know? Or what if Buddy had just said, you know what, I'll just go on being a mediocre elf in the North Pole and never find out what might be in store for me in New York City. See, it would blow our mind. They would never do that, we say. But you know what? Here's the truth, guys. We do that all the time when it comes to our own story. God is standing there saying, I've got this incredible mission I want you to engage in. And we're like, no thanks. Have you seen this new video game? No thanks. My favorite TV show is on. No thanks. I'm more worried about my friends at school and hanging out and being liked by them. When God has given us an incredible call to join him in an incredible mission. So here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do now for the next few minutes. We're going to open up the Bible. We're going to look at a passage. I want you guys to focus in, to pay attention. I told you guys before that I believe middle schoolers are capable of great things. Prove me right tonight by diving into the Word and going deep with me in the Scriptures. So Acts chapter 8, and we pick up this story right after Stephen. Some of you remember the story. Stephen goes before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. He makes a great speech, and then they kill him. So not a good ending to Stephen's story, but a good ending because he goes to be with Jesus. Now we pick it up in chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
In verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now here's what just happened. God allowed persecution to fall on the church so the gospel would get out. Because up to this point, the church had been a little harassed, had been a little bothered, but they hadn't really, really been persecuted. But in chapter 8, all of a sudden, the persecution steps up like we just read. Saul begins ravaging the church. People are getting killed. People are getting thrown in prison. And now the Christians have to scatter. They've got to move out of Jerusalem and Judea and go somewhere else. And when they go, the Bible tells us in verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. God brings persecution on the church so the word will go out. And this reminds us that, you know what? We are going to face persecution in our mission. God didn't call us to be comfortable. God didn't call us to be convenient. God called us to go out. And there will be opposition. There will be persecution. Some people will not like it. Jesus promised it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. He said, blessed are you when people persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of things about you on account of my name. He said, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Rejoice. Because great is your reward in heaven. God actually tells us this crazy thing. He says, when when people oppose you, persecute you. When they reject you or, or, or leave you out of stuff. He says, rejoice and be glad. Isn't that crazy? That's like, that's like you're trying to talk to your friends about Jesus, and they're like, no, we don't want to hear that. And 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 on top of it, we're not gonna let you sit with us at our table at lunch anymore. And you're like, yes! I was hoping, that is so awesome. High five. No, still not feeling it? Okay, I'll be back later. We'll talk about Jesus again. Rejoice and be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Why? Because that is what God has called us to. You've got to have a long-term view. There will be persecution. Some people will not like it. By the way, not on the whole. On the whole, most people are open to talking about it. Most people are open to hearing about it. But here's the deal. There will be some persecution. But it's not that bad compared to what some people have to go through. Uh, there's a story in, in Nick Ripkin's book, called The Insanity of God, where he talks about Christian young adults living under the rule of communist Russia back in the 1950s. And back in the early 50s in Russia, three pastors who organized home churches, uh, these three pastors organized these home churches that consisted of about 10 to 20 people. They couldn't be any bigger. They couldn't be like this because of security. Because the communists would find them, shut them down, and throw their leaders in jail. So these churches were only about 10 to 20 people. And there were young people in these churches like you. And these young people felt isolated and alone. They felt like, I'm the only Christian in the world. No one else believes this because the churches had to be so small and couldn't be as connected. So these three pastors took it upon themselves to organize a youth congress, they called it, in Moscow uh, in the 1950s for people aged 18 to 30. And 700 showed up. So a huge crowd showed up there in communist Russia. Not one of them was fortunate enough to own a Bible. You and I are like, I got the Bible on my phone. But you couldn't have a Bible in communist Russia. It didn't go well for you. So they did not have a Bible. They got into small groups, though, and tried to recreate the Gospels from memory. At the end of the conference, they had re- recreated all of the Gospels from memory with only half a dozen errors. Now, we've, we've got probably about five to 600 in the warehouse right here tonight. You think if we put all of us together, we could recreate all the Gospels from memory? I don't think so. But that's amazing. They also recreated the lyrics of 1,200 songs, choruses, and hymns there at that conference. You see, persecution had forced them to go deep with the Lord, so much so that they had memorized His Word. And those three pastors, (laughs) after the conference, the communists did not like it, so they actually sentenced those pastors to three years in prison for having the conference, but they said they would do it all over again. I don't know if they told me, Brian, you can have beach camp, but after beach camp, we're going to send you and your interns to prison. And I'm like, well, no beach camp this year. (laughs) Not these guys. They said, persecution, bring it on. Why? Because Jesus is worth it, and God can use it. And Here's the thing. These folks were scattered because of persecution, and they go about preaching the word. It reminds us that every occasion can advance the gospel. 
Everything in your life can be an opportunity for the gospel, whether that's your, your football team or your basketball team or your cheerleading squad or the clarinet section in the band or that family reunion you've got to go to. Right? Every opportunity we have in life can be an opportunity to advance the gospel. See, when we scatter from here, because at the end of the night, we'll pray, we'll leave. When we scatter, that's your chance to go out and live this mission and live every moment to the glory of God. So we see them scattering for the gospel. And when we leave here, we will scatter for the gospel and head out into our mission. But then we read this in verse 5. Philip, one of those who had to scatter, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. So Philip leaves, and he knows the call is to go anywhere that the gospel needs to be preached. And for him, that means going to Samaria. Now, this was a little bit mind-blowing because Samaria was the last place you would expect a good Jew to go. Samaria was a place that had formerly been populated by Israelites, but then a foreign nation came in, decimated that land, took a lot of people off into exile, brought a lot of foreigners in, and then they intermingled and intermarried with the Israelites. So the Jewish people looked on the Samaritans like half-breeds. For those of you uh, who could think about it, they, they were people who basically were outside of the people of God, people they didn't want to associate with, people they didn't want to be around. But Philip knows these people need the gospel, so he goes to Samaria. He preaches and the people listen. And this is the very first movement of the gospel. The gospel of 1 Corinthians uh, 15. The complete gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. It's the first movement of the gospel outside of Jerusalem and Judea. And Philip takes it to the land of Samaria. Here's the thing. Are we willing to go wherever the gospel needs to be proclaimed? It was the early 1700s when... John Leonard Dober and David Nitschman were sitting in a church service in Europe. And their pastor was sharing about an island in the Caribbean. It's today called St. Thomas Island. And on this island there lived an atheist slaveholder who had over 3,000 slaves, none of whom had ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he, in fact, this atheist slave owner had said, I will not allow any pastors or missionaries to come to my island. In fact, if one even shipwrecks on the island, I'll put him in a house away from from our plantation, and when the next boat comes, I will ship him out because I am not allowing anyone to share with these slaves. Well, John Dobear and David Nitschman were so moved by what they heard that day that they decided we have got to get the gospel to these slaves. So their plan was this, to sell themselves into slavery so they could go and minister to those slaves. Their families tried to dissuade them, but they were set in their cause, and they went down booked passage on a boat, went down to the dock with their families, boarded the ship, and as the ship drifted away from the land, John and David linked arms and shouted out this across the water. They said, May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And with that, they set sail to be slaves. Now they found out eventually that, uh, that white men couldn't be slaves, at that time, and so instead they went as laborers to this island and were able to work alongside with these slaves, share the gospel with these slaves, see many of them come to Christ, and then eventually opening the door for more missionaries to come until eventually on seven different islands there in the Caribbean, there were 13,000 new believers among those slaves because two guys said, we will sell ourselves into slavery if that's what it takes. And, and some of us are like, well, I don't know if I want to go on a mission trip this year because, well, Disney World. And these guys were planning to sell themselves into slavery. Are we willing to say this is worth it? This is worth I'll take the gospel anywhere, God. Anywhere you want me to go. And when Philip goes to Samaria, he proclaims. Here's what he proclaims. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. This is verse 5. And proclaimed to them the Christ. Now that word is not insignificant. It doesn't say, though it could say, Paul proclaimed to them Jesus. It says Paul proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, what does Christ mean? When I was growing up, I thought Christ was Jesus' last name. You know, like my name is Brian Jennings. He's Jesus Christ. That's how it works. But Christ is actually a title. 
and it refers to the Old Testament Messiah. The one prophesied about in the Old Testament. The one who would come from the line of David and rule over his people. The one who would save their people from their sins. That Messiah, that Christ. And so Philip goes and he's proclaiming to them that the promised Messiah, the Christ, has come. This is a faith thousands of years in the making. This is a good news that's been coming for a long time. And guess what? We've got the same thing. We're not inventing something new. It wasn't like me and Chris Page and Ashley got together and said, hey guys, what should we teach them this year, huh? You know? No, we didn't do that. Like, what are we going to teach them? Same thing we've been talking about for thousands and thousands of years. It's just as powerful and it's just as true. We don't have to reinvent it. We don't have to be creative with it. We just got to preach it. Jesus, the Christ, has come. The one prophesied about in the Old Testament. The one who walked the earth, died for sins, and rose again. The one who's reigning at the right hand of his Father and one day is going to bust the skies open on a white horse to take us all home. That Jesus is the one we proclaim. So you're here tonight and you're like, well, Brian, this mission, it sounds cool. Did you think of it? Did you make it up? No. It's been happening for thousands of years and it will happen for as long as it needs to happen until that sky splits and we all go home. That's what you're part of. That's who you proclaim. Jesus the Christ. Now, here's what happens next. Verse 6, And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Now that is some pretty awesome signs. You know, I bet, I bet a lot of people would show up if we had, hey guys, Wednesday night at Pulse, next week we're having exorcisms. Bring your demon-possessed friends out. Like, that would be pretty cool. Maybe we can work on that. I don't know. (laughs) That would be freaky. But here's the deal. Philip was doing all kinds of signs. People were being healed. Lame were walking. Unclean spirits were getting out. People were being healed. They were seeing signs. And there's two things we note from this passage. They heard the good news of the gospel, and they saw signs that went with it. Here's what that means for us. The gospel is shown through signs and actions, and it is spoken through words. Because here's the deal. Actions are not enough. Like, I hope, I, I really do hope that you all are living lives that glorify God. I hope that when you go to school, when you are at home, when you go out in public, you are living good lives that glorify God. I hope you're serving others. But here's the deal. It takes more than that. When I was at Virginia Tech, I had to take a class. I tried to take 15 hours of community service to complete my degree. It was part of my uh, leadership minor was doing community service. And my community service had to be through the Virginia Tech Community Service office. So I went to the office and they said, okay, show up these weekends, do these different projects. And so we did different projects. We worked on a war memorial in a small rural town in Virginia. Uh, We installed carpet in in the home of a man who was too poor and too sick to do it himself. Uh, We did things like that. We, We took furniture around and gave it away to people who didn't have it. It was good stuff, right? But what was it for? A diploma, okay? It was to earn credit. And what's funny is it looks exactly the same as things that I've done on mission trips in the name of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? One's for school, one's for Jesus. How do people out there know the difference? They don't. Unless we say, hey, this one's for Jesus. Okay, just FYI, so you would know Jesus Jesus is making me do this. Not making me in a bad way, but in a good way. Never mind. Moving on. You get it. Right? So, so we've got to have actions. Right? We've, we've got to be doing. That's why we do Love Loud. Right? Coming up here in October. So that our community and the people around us will see we're different. Listen, the people in your school or your homeschool co-op or your family, if you have lost people in your family, or the ones you play on the sports team with, should know there's something different about you. And if they don't, what are you doing? The gospel needs Signs, but at the same thing, same time, they won't know why it's different if you don't speak up and say something. I've never seen this happen before. You know, somebody walking by saying, Oh, look at those nice people feeding those homeless people. I'll ask Jesus into my heart. 
Right? That doesn't happen. We have to speak the gospel and show the gospel. Philip did signs, and he also preached. And, and here's the last thing tonight. And I want you to get this one, because this is my favorite part of the whole thing right here. And in verse 7, we'll, we'll pick it up, verse 7. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Verse 8. So there was much joy in that city. See, here's my hope. My hope is that us as middle schoolers in this room tonight, and by us I mean you, because I'm not a middle schooler, but I'm part of y'all, all in this together, is that we would live out the gospel in such a way that there would be joy in Woodstock or Canton or Ackworth or wherever you're at because we are in the city. That, that because you're in your school, because you're in that band, because you're on that team, because you're in your family, because you are there, people would have more joy in Jesus. So that if we were to be gone tomorrow, if First Baptist Woodstock and you and me were to disappear tomorrow, people would be sad because we brought them so much joy in Jesus Christ. Is that what we're doing? You see this happening in the book of Acts. There was this woman, and her name was Dorcas. It's a very unfortunate name. And Dorcas did all these wonderful acts of service for people in her city. And Dorcas dies in Acts chapter 9. And when she does, all the people of the city come out, and they are weeping and mourning that this woman has, has left them taking things that Dorcas had made for them and being like, we miss her. She brought us so much joy, this Christian woman. And guys, that's what we need. We need an army of Dorcases. <laughs> now, we don't need to call it that. But here's the deal. We can put that on a shirt. It'll be great. Um, but listen, listen. Here's the deal. Here's what we need. We need... Sixth graders and seventh graders and eighth graders who are scattering from here, showing, speaking the gospel, and bringing joy to the places where they go that comes from Jesus Christ. Do you guys think we can do that? Do you think? Not if you're with me on that. And here's the thing. I'll close with this. A lot of us think, you know what? I go to a school of 1,500 people. What difference can I make? I, I'm a homeschool kid. You know, I, I'm at home most of the time. What difference can I make? We think, you know what, I'm not very popular. What difference can I make? I'm not very talented. I'm not very athletic. Not good at talking. Shy. What difference can I make? There's an old story that I'm, I'm quite fond of, and I'll share it with you. And it goes like this. One day a man was walking along the beach. And as he walked along the beach, he looked down and he, he saw a young boy just walking down. And he would stoop down every, every few feet, stoop down, pick something up, and throw it into the ocean. So the man walks down. The sun is setting. The tide is, is heading out. And as he gets closer, he sees that what this young boy is doing is reaching down. There are, there are literally thousands of starfish that have washed up on the beach. And as the tide is, is going away... All these starfish are slowly dying because they're no longer in the ocean. And what this boy is doing is going around and picking up one starfish at a time, tossing it back into the ocean. So the man walks up to the boy and he says, son, what are you doing? He said, well, there's, if, if I don't throw these starfish back into the ocean, they're going to die. And the man said, well, boy, there are thousands of starfish out here. And, and on, on so many other beaches across the world, there are tens of thousands of starfish that are dying right now because they're not in the ocean. What difference can you possibly hope to make? What does it matter that you throw these starfish back in? Then the boy bent over, picked up another one, and looked up at the man with all the wisdom of a young boy. And he said, it matters to this one. And with that, he threw the starfish into the sea. And that's exactly what we need to realize. There may be 1,500 people at your school. You may be at home most of the time as a homeschooler. You may not have great talent or great ability, but here's the deal. You can matter to one person. You can matter to the people in your circle. You can make a difference there that will last in eternity and join 
the greatest mission on earth. But here's my question. Will you? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed, here's the challenge tonight. Twofold, twofold. First of all, if you're here tonight and you say, Brian, I have never trusted in this Jesus, this thousands of year old message that is still changing lives today. Jesus is not my Savior. Jesus is not my Lord. Then tonight, I want to challenge you right here, right now to receive Jesus. To do that, I'm just going to ask you, say right now, you say, Brian, I need Jesus. Right now, just lift up your hand. You say that. Brian, I need to receive Jesus for the first time. He is not my Savior tonight. I can't join this mission because I'm not a Christian. And tonight that needs to change. If that's you, just lift up a hand. No one's looking around. No one's scanning the crowd. All right. Second thing here tonight. Second thing. For the Christians in this crowd, right now, just focus for a moment. Are you willing to join God's mission? Where is he calling you to make a difference? Where is he calling you to go? Who is he calling you to talk to? Right now, from your heart to God's heart, ask him, Lord, what would you have me do? How are you calling me to join this mission? And as we worship and sing here in just a moment, I want to challenge you to respond. You can respond in several ways. You can kneel where you are and pray. You can come down front, kneel at the front of this stage, and commit it to the Lord. You may need to grab a friend and pray with them. But let's not leave here before we do business with God and join his mission. Father, I thank you so much that you have not left us to find our own purpose in life, but you have called us to join the greatest mission on earth and in history. And I pray that whatever is holding us back, we would let it go and be people who show the gospel through our deeds and speak the gospel through our words when we scatter from here. So God, I pray that you would take the next few minutes that we have. God, don't let us be distracted. Don't let us be thinking about other things, but let us think about your call on our life and let us respond. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.